I'm the respondent, and my name's Georgina Bourne, and I'm Professor of Music and Anthropology at Oxford University. And I want first to thank the speakers warmly for their contributions. Uh, and in response, I'm going to make three opening political points and then offer some ideas about value. First, we've heard cogent diagnoses of the causes and effects of the threatened cuts. But in light of Pete's convincing case for the sturdy commonalities between the sciences and arts, I'm struck by Richard's comment on the lack of a unified response to government policies on the part of the British Academy and Royal Society. But, and my second point, I want to call for political alliances in a different direction. That is, after Julia's cogent arguments just now for the development, I want to argue for the development of cross-sectoral alliances between the elite universities such as Oxford and Cambridge and the less well-endowed and the new universities. Thank you, Julia. Thank you. If we support the principle of the extension of the higher educational franchise that has occurred over recent decades, then it's the defense of the sector as a whole that is at stake. A defense that can't, of course, preclude criticism and self-criticism of disturbing actualities of what past policies, notably the RAE, have wrought, for example, in its effects on teaching. Uh, third, I note that no one except for Mike Kenny at the outset has pushed home two key economic arguments, which are, as he said, both uh, they're necessary but not sufficient for our cause. The first is how singularly successful, also economically, are the British universities. And second, how crucial to the forms of economic growth open to the UK is a highly educated population and a strong scientific research sector. On both counts, the cuts are irrational and destructive, even in the terms of economic neoliberalism. Now, with the rest of my time, I want both to address the question of value and to respond to the challenge set by the organizers of building a picture of university research and arts practice from the inside. And I do this by proposing a certain idea of progress in the social sciences and humanities. <coughs> One of the best statements of this kind comes from the anthropologist Marilyn Strathern, who's in the room with us today. As Marilyn tells us in her book, The Gender of the Gift, I'm quoting, when Moss was defending his use of the term gift to refer to economies based on gift exchange, he had in mind a contrast with the principles of the so-called natural economy or utilitarianism. She continues by pointing out how the hallmark of the social sciences is to produce innovation by what she calls the advantage of the contrast. And this, to me, resonates perhaps with Martin's uh, defense of notions of difference. Too often, Marilyn Strett says, we disparage the movement from one position to another as relativity. This disparagement hides the cumulative achievement of social science, which is constantly to build up the conditions from which the world can be apprehended anew. That regenerative capacity constitutes the ability to extend meanings, to occupy different <coughs> viewpoints. She concludes th that the knowledge accumulated through social science is distinctive in creating the conditions for new thought. And moreover, that creating the grounds for new thought emerges as a kind of deliberate counterproduction. I think there are echoes here in Fenella's uh, uh, idea of a radical comparativism. Now, what this suggests, I think, is an image of the knowledge produced by the social sciences, uh, social sciences as fostering an enlarged or expanded cycle or arc of social or collective reflexivity. And while this is true of the arts and humanities as well as the social sciences, of course, each favors particular historical, epistemological, and aesthetic grounds and genres. Equally striking in Marilyn's account is the stress no, not so much on the pastness of disciplines as on their present and future-oriented nature, one that in Marilyn's rendering, and I agree, is as or more significant, for this is how the counterproductive potential of knowledge operates most effectively, we might even say efficiently. An example here would be Raymond's telling point, ironic or not, about the need for philosophical and historical understandings of democracy 
as the only basis for judging Blair's call for aggressive intervention in Iran. Standing in the welcome shade of Marilyn's ideas, I want briefly to relate the slender example of my own work, which tries to cross between the social sciences, arts and humanities, between anthropology on the one hand and music and media on the other. I've undertaken two ethnographic studies of renowned centers of cultural production, of the modernist computer music institute IRCAM in Paris and of the BBC. In each case, the focus was on a crisis of the lineage of musical modernism and of the institution of public service broadcasting. In both studies, I was able to analyze the historical and present circumstances that produced such crisis and to elucidate the conditions for creative practice and their effects on what was made. The result was to generate a perspective that in Marilyn's terms made it possible, I hope, for my interlocutors and the public to apprehend the world anew. At best, this kind of work proffers an understanding of the conditions within which certain kinds of creativity and invention are possible or not. Moreover, through dialogue with my interlocutors, the studies can fuel their evolving aesthetic, ethical, and social reflexivity concerning their own work, as well as generating expanded terms for both criticism and legitimation. A further step, without great compromise, can be to inform policy, if it will listen, which often it will not. To end my response, we are today, it seems to me, at the beginning of a long overdue discussion about the value of this counterproduction, the current crisis issues a demand. But the discussion can't be about producing PR for outdated certainties. The old pieties are worn thin, ideas merely of the growth in self-knowledge, but as Raymond asked, whose self, whose knowledge, or the defense of canons or of essential human values? And uh, after Martin's paper, uh, I would want to add, who's music? And uh, as music educators, we currently see a really extraordinary bifurcation of music university education in the global north between, on the one hand, a musically literate, in formal terms, minority in the UK increasingly drawn exclusively from the public schools who attend universities like Oxford and Cambridge, and on the other hand, an oral literacy of the vast majority of children and students who are brought up in the age of the MP3 and the laptop. Uh, and this issue is an extraordinary challenge to us as educators in the University of Music. Instead, we have to argue for the present and future orientation of the arts, humanities, and social sciences, and the values and goals this entails. And we have surely to acknowledge the strange failure thus far to articulate new positive accounts, apart from those delivered under the banner of the creative or knowledge economy, of why these fields of endeavor and education matter. If Jen and Julia spoke compellingly of the social value and advantages of extending the educational franchise, we hear less, we've heard less, about the augmentation of specifically cultural value and its key functions in enlarging the social capacity for emancipating the imagination, <coughs> as well as critical and self-critical thought. But we should also look, finally, for evidence of progress in the institutionalization of knowledge. To take one example that's interesting to me, it's notable that the teaching of history of science and history of art, which used quite recently at Cambridge and Oxford to end in the early or mid 20th century, that this now extends closer to the present, even taking in current developments. To foster such progress under Chatham House rules, we should, I think, debate fiercely and act politically, also in relation to our own institutions, openly discussing awkward questions to do with the irrationalities and prejudices that exist. For example, and these will be contentious, they're my own list of questions. Why, in the hierarchy of knowledges, are historical forms of scholarship judged by default to have superior importance or insight? when compared, say, to anthropological or sociological knowledge? Why is the historical depth or age of a discipline taken as an index of its value? Why is theoretical or philosophical abstraction considered to prevail over rich and specific empirical research? So these are just examples of discussions we might have internally. 
or from a different direction, and here I'm going to end, and more pointedly, in terms of institutional reflexivity and self-knowledge. We might ask, how can institutions dedicated to the pursuit of truth and the public good continue routinely in the face of copious long-standing research and evidence on these matters to reproduce inequalities in the employment chances of women and non-white people in its staffing and to do the same in its admission policies? Thank you. Thank you.